Hi, I'm Shakti Durga. Welcome to the Goddess Speaks podcast. This is a collection of discourses from the ancient goddess Artha containing spiritual energy and activations and discussions of those discourses. I hope that the teachings are beneficial to you on your personal journey of enlightenment. Last week, we had a very rich discourse from Arthur. God bless Arthur. So I thought it would be rather good to have a look at what she said because I'm sometimes amazed when I read them back again what exactly it is that has happened. And this one was particularly like that, the subtlety and exactly where we're at now. It's just amazing how the Devi does that with us. It was all about light really last week. Let's go through it. The functions of light are beyond what is currently within the awareness of humanity at this time in the evolutionary cycle. It was stated on a previous occasion that the ancients, as we perceive them on earth, had a very different idea about consciousness to what's currently in vogue amongst humanity. That which is in vogue currently worships knowledge, whereas the ancients knew that this was only one part of consciousness and that beyond what the rational mind's capable of lies a vast ocean of knowledge and wisdom and potential for development and that the human potential is barely touched in the current age. It's always a conundrum for the soul considering its next incarnation as to which of the ages it wishes to place itself in. That tells you a lot about time. It really is saying that time is a phenomena that is not what we think it is. And I've seen myself in uh, healings and goodness knows what in the past that future and past for lives aren't necessarily a sequential thing, but they can pop all over the place. And sometimes people have had a life in what we would call the future, and they're able to bring the awareness and the learning from that to the past in some energetic sense and help fuel change. And so it's not like they remember all the things about their future life, but there's some energy they carry that starts to work its way through. Very interesting. From the place in which the soul makes such a decision, all of the ages are happening simultaneously. Of course, within the ages, from the inside of the divine Leela, of course there is an historical context. But have you ever wondered at the veil that seems to be drawn around humanity going back more than about 10,000 years? It's very difficult to know anything before that, don't you agree? It's like history stopped maybe a couple of thousand years before Christ. The veil's been drawn there by the divine to allow a freshness to emerge into each of the successive years and periods of time. And it's incumbent upon us to focus on the time frame that we call now more and more as we walk forward in these lives. Whilst it's instructive to sometimes study the histories, Arthur was telling us, try and study now. Bring as much of your awareness, as much of yourself and soulfulness, your full soulfulness, into the now as you can. Feel the now, she was saying. And of course, this is going to create that we become very embodied in the physicality. And the interesting thing is that in the Kabbalistic teachings, they say, that in order to become in any way enlightened, there's a requirement that we kind of let go of our physical focus as the main thing and we'll travel through the various realms as our development, karma and awareness will allow us and we go into the higher realms from Asiya, the physical realm, we go into Yetzirah, the astral world, and then Bria, which is the soul realm. And then finally, we kind of dock in Atsalut, which is the divine dimension in Kabbalah. And then 
we come back down the tree of life again. So coming back down through all those lovely gorgeous sephira that we learned about recently, some of you know about them from a long time ago, but we have to come back down and bring that divine into everything. And at the moment in our mystery school, the turn of the spiral that we're on is bringing, really docking and anchoring all that divine energy into our physical lives. And so that takes a lot of strength to do that, takes a lot of presence, takes perseverance, of course, and we have to do a lot of practices to be enabled to bring that kind of vibration of the divine into everyday life. But that's really the purpose of what we're doing at the moment, as much as continuous consciousness is the goal of the sun mysteries. The embodiment of heaven on earth is something that I've always known is a reality that we can reach to. And it doesn't mean that the whole of the earth suddenly becomes a paradise and nobody has any problems anymore. It doesn't even mean that we won't have any problems anymore. And if you look at the lives of avatars, take Ram, for example, who had all kinds of icky things he had to deal with. So did Krishna. So did all of the incarnations of the gods. They always end up with all these problems that they have to solve. And it's not about the problem. It's about how they go about solving it that's instructive and that lifts and shifts humanity. And, of course, their presence does too. And so we know that the more we can come into our majority as embodied, blazing, light-filled souls, then the more we're going to be able to help with the overall plan of love and light being anchored on earth. And now more than ever with the great mutation just around the corner, which is a very, very exciting 800-year phenomena, it's really important that we pull on everything we've got about our divine self and try and live it to the max. So Arthur's saying, be in the now. It's kind of a very hackneyed teaching, be in the now, be in the now. But if we can do it, it'll be very, very powerful. Arthur then linked that with that which gives us our humanity is enclosed within the liver. That which gives you your divinity is enclosed within your heart. So I find that very interesting. What about you? For a long time, I've been aware of the teaching of the seed of life being in the liver, but to find that this is related to the ego is new for me and I think makes a ton of sense because let's face it, the liver is the big cleaning machine in the body and it gets all the rubbish dumped on it. And I suppose the heart also looks after the bloodstream, but really the cleaning is done in the liver and we know through our teachings on Hridaya around the sacred heart that there is some divine connection very strong there. Arthur went on to say, there are such mysteries to be revealed to us in the way that these things interact with each other. One can see the human part as less than the divine part, but this is a fault in consciousness derived because we seek to analyse something to understand it and thus divide it into parts. However, the truth of the matter is it's one whole. It's one continuous whole that deserves to be treated with sacredness. Certainly makes liver cleansing diets suddenly seem a lot more relevant, doesn't it? The trend that's developing in this group to bring more wholeheartedness is applauded by the spiritual hierarchy. And a growing trend for you will be the appreciation of the whole of life, which can't progress where we're ignorant and dismissive of our physical reality. And I'm just wondering if people are relating to this teaching at all. I'm wondering if anyone has had a bit of a sense of, yeah, well, I am a bit dismissive sometimes of the physical, much easier to focus on other things. Imagine that your assignment is to bring the divine into your physical life. How would the divine lead your physical life? That's the question, I guess. And there will be a lot of subtleties because we're all good people doing the good things we can in the world, even if not everyone agrees with all of our decisions. We still are 
good people trying to do our best and be good people in the world. So there'll be subtle shifts. And Arthur says, there's subtleties involved in this discussion as have been alluded to already because we're not talking about the egoic worship of physical bodies as seen in fashion magazines. We're talking about something wholesome and deep and fruitful, something that brings nourishing life, something for which the goddess is waiting to see this development within humanity in this turn of the spiral. And she said, and you, beloved ones, can help with this. Wow. Feels like we've been given an assignment for sure. Hmm. It's already been said that the volume of love that you yet understand is still small compared to what's available to us. And this exercise that's given to this group around becoming more conscious of the now, more conscious of your physical body and its sacredness, will be part of your further evolution into an expansion of more love than you ever thought possible. There's an incentive. (laughs) You already know that the divine is infinite. It follows that consciousness is infinite. And as the divine is love and bliss and light, it follows that these things too will expand as your consciousness does. And that no matter how enlightened you seem to be, there can never be an upper limit to this procedure of enlightenment occurring within our being. And then she says, well, when is enough, beloveds? And she answered it, your heart and soul will tell you. How to bring a new balance into your life will emerge rather than being planned. It's an emergent thing. Matters that are emergent arise from your soul, not your mind. And thus it takes a moment for your rational mind to catch up and to create systems around what's emerging and structures as well. And she said, allow the emergent nature to continue this trajectory because this will do us a lot of good and allow us to do even greater good in the world. Arthur said, a group such as this exerts a positive influence on all of humanity not just because of the projects with which you're involved, which of themselves are laudable, but there's also the consciousness aspect. And over time, you'll come to understand more of the way in which your consciousness, being centred and founded in love and unity and togetherness and caring, has a more profound effect than you realise. When you feel within yourself disdain, frustration arising, or a wish or desire to pull back from unity and love? Arthur says, be aware that you may have reached the frontiers of your consciousness and that the ego might be rebelling. Hmm. When we feel that thing of pulling back, yeah. This is the eternal dance of the Leela of humanity. It's just the eternal dance. Stepping forward into more light and the need to integrate this into your vehicles of all levels of subtlety, including the physical vehicle. Wow. So, yep, integrate it right in. As your consciousness expands, you will realize that your subtle bodies and your physical bodies are a continuum, and that there is nothing gross about the physical body at all. The body, the physical body, like all other bodies, is only comprised of energy. And this energy is capable of holding different formulations of light. And as you become more sensitive to the way in which your body is an instrument of energy, it is a creation of energy. And that the energy within your liver, in the seed that's held within the liver, permeates throughout this consciousness held in your body. She said, then you'll have more willingness to explore how to best know and understand the physical body. That's quite a big concept, isn't it? That the subtle body and the physical body are a continuum. And I think she was reading our minds because when I think about the thought forms that we have about our physical body, I think we do think it's separate, don't you? From all that yummy inner plane stuff that we kind of like. So I just wonder whether you relate to that, whether that Maya is something that you haven't thought about maybe, but wow, yes, we can of course see the body is only energy. Energy is the flip side of light. So the body really is just light dressed up 
as the physical. So Maya is so fascinating. For some time, the body has taken a battering over the years. And this has happened, of course, through karma. You know, we forget, don't we? It's not anticipated that we will castigate ourselves for the battering that the body may have taken through external agencies or through internal habits. But understand it's never too late for change. It's never too late for evolution. And now is the moment where you can let in the eternal now. When you move into, yeah, I'll do it tomorrow, yeah, I'll do it next week, you are in the realm of your limited ego consciousness. When you step into the now, you have power. When you step into the now, even if it's just within your mind for a moment, call forth your higher soul to empower you for what it is you wish to achieve in this moment of now. And she said, be present, beloved ones, and congruent in your energy. Having the stillness that's required to properly formulate ideas in your consciousness without rushing and without the ideas disappearing like puffs of smoke, not really forming into the full formulation that you're attempting. So it feels like she's telling us to bring into the now what we're trying to do not put it off and dwell on it with the mind long enough for a proper thought form (laughs) to at least take place in that moment. And then she says, remember that fast as thought might be, light is faster. And light in its subtle aspect is even faster, i.e. faster than the speed of light in its gross aspect. And I'm only using the word gross to try and say physical aspect. The higher consciousness is much faster than the lower consciousness. You'll find a meaning to this as your studies progress. But for now, please note this in your spiritual journal. She actually asked us and repeated it. The divine light is faster than low vibrational consciousness and much faster than your mind. And so I feel like that's clearly very important The divine light is faster than low vibrational consciousness and much faster than your mind. I feel, I don't think Arthur said it, but I have an intuition that as she's getting us to try and focus on this stuff, by being in the now, being steadfast in our practices and being really open to our full V diagram of consciousness equation thing, that she's going to show us how to see the future because the light consciousness is faster than the mind. The mind can't really see round corners, but the higher consciousness can. When you take sanctuary and refuge in right now, as your focus is right now, and you breathe into right now, and ground yourself through your feet in the right now, into the earth, and you allow the earth to be present for you in the right now, and you feel your body now, when you take time for this, which might take seconds, that's enough time to override the fear centers in the body that arise in your consciousness and would trick you into an anxious response to something that doesn't require anxiety. Oh my God, I feel like this is just totally, totally what we all need to hear right now. When you take sanctuary and refuge in right now, as you focus right now and you breathe into right now and you ground yourself through the feet in the right now into the earth and allow the earth to be present for you in the right now and you feel your body in the now, when you take the time for all of this, which will take a couple of seconds, it's enough time to override the fear centers in the body that arise in your consciousness and would trick you into an anxious response to something that does not require anxiety. I wish I'd remembered that this morning when I had an anxious response about not being able to find a power cord. Do you ever find that these things happen really fast and that your anxious responses are there before you really have time to de-anxious them? 
Does anybody else have that going on in their life? (laughs) Well, this seems to be a pretty good recipe for how we can deal with that. Like I'm just really feeling that this is so important. I want to make that into a bumper sticker or probably too long for a bumper sticker, but it's got to go somewhere up on my wall, I think. Anyway, Arthur said that in all that gentleness is necessary for everyone who's incarnate as a human does have a vulnerable self that needs to be nurtured. And the more proficient we become in this nurturing, the stronger we become until we become of the strength of an avatar. That's a pretty big statement when you think how strong the avatars that we have in our life are far out. So she's really giving us a formula here for a very profound change. And, you know, those of you who've known me for a long time have heard me talk about astrology as surfing waves, that when you know what's happening in the heavens, it's a wave of energy coming, and if you know about it, you can surf it. And so just think of board riders who are out there and you're watching them, and when a wave's coming, they generally start paddling before the wave hits them, don't they, to catch the wave. They don't wait until the wave is on top of them and then start paddling because they'd miss the wave. So there's something very important in this piece that we're talking about right now for catching the wave of the great mutation. I feel that Arthur's given us the key here to just focus on that. Can you imagine what would happen if you weren't going into a hissy fit of anxiety every five minutes? around stuff that's just trivial and afterwards you think, what was all that about? What did I do that for? And then, of course, because we're ensconced in Maya, we tend to think, well, because someone annoyed me or because some external thing over there happened when, of course, that's just an excuse. That's okay for beginners. It's not okay for us. So, yeah, I feel like we've just been given something in the now, in the now, in the now. The development of these things, says Arthur, is not impossible and other human beings before you have achieved it. If you are steadfast in your aim and effort to expand your consciousness into the divine, then much will be revealed to you and gifts beyond your current imagining will be open to you. You've been taught that the divine uses the carrot and stick to motivate people. So this is a carrot, she said. It's saying that dangling right before your nose is an invitation to more love than you ever thought possible and that this will be achieved through the expansion of consciousness and continuation of our practices. And she said, it's pleasing to note that more and more of you are starting to become more stable and steadfast in the daily practices. To try and do these things at a similar time is advisable. But if for some unforeseen reason or a lack of planning, or you just didn't think that you needed to plan for this, and you miss your practice, please try and do at least your mantras before going to bed or at any stage during the day. She said these mantras that we're using are weaving light around us and that the light will weave into your three seeds of consciousness. And that was news to me too, that the light from our mantras is going to weave into our three seeds of consciousness and they will be like a flower in which you have your being, a beautiful flower, and it will become like a flying vessel for you eventually in subtle ways that you'll be able to move your consciousness with much more freedom than you've ever so far experienced. Far out. This sounds like super good to me. Sometimes our spiritual training can seem repetitive. Huh. And it's meant to be, beloved ones, because otherwise no stability emerges. The repetitive nature of these teachings is designed to reinforce for you the importance of the foundation teachings at this stage in your spiritual journey. Everything that came before is relevant and important, but right now, in this moment of now, caring for the self Nurturing the self and loving the self is your main work. So there's really no way out of that, is there? 
Arthur's here to tell you none of you are nurturing yourself, caring for yourself and loving yourself sufficiently and that if you think you are, that there's some Maya involved, there's a bit of delusion, that the efforts you're making are sufficient for where the divine would like to take us. She said, none of you are yet in a place where there is sufficiency in self-care to enable the journey of vastness that we're developing the karma for. (laughs) So please, beloved ones, don't overlook things that may sound too simple. For some of you, these things are very difficult. And for some of you, it will be very easy. But regardless, be present to the eternal moment of now. And she said, may the light of the infinite be with you always. And may you always be connected to that light. We ask this in full faith. Om, om, om. I hope you enjoyed this episode of The Goddess Speaks. If so, please share it with your friends and your family so they can benefit too. If you'd like to connect with me, visit my website, shaktidurga.com.